is more than sufficient for us, Lord. We thank you that your love is is relentless, is is boundaryless, Lord, that through everything you've provided for us and you've given us a way to to walk with you through this life, Lord. So we just thank you so much. We praise you and we lift it all up to you in, in your name. All right, there you go. <clears throat> Sorry, my voice going to be in and out and everything else. I was really, really sick uh, early Saturday morning. And uh, just say it's one of the best workouts I've had in a long time. Uh, and, you know, I, you know, it's like there's certain things you don't want to talk about from the pulpit. But, man, I was thinking about so many funny things back there, and I was just like, nah, I better not. Um, you know, just to tell you that, you know, the stomach acid has burnt my throat. So, um, you know, just fighting with that. Uh, and then, of course, the, you know, just from here all the way to the back, man, just super cramps. But the Lord is good, and we're going to be here no matter what. Um, so let's lift it up right now to a word of prayer. Father, we come to you, and we thank you so much <clears throat> for your word that guides us, your word that gives us your peace, your love, and your, your joy. And Father, even as we sing, even though when times, Lord, seem so tough, seem like we can't get out of it, Lord, when our hearts and our minds and our own, our, our own feelings trap us in places and make it hard, Lord, just so hard to operate, Lord, you are good. You are holy and you are true. And Father, you deliver us even from ourselves. So, Lord, I lift every person here up to you this morning. I pray that your Holy Spirit be on them and that they hear from you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. I know, we, you know, I talk to you guys and I ask questions sometimes about, like, what is church? Um, you know, is church this building? Most of us would answer no, church isn't this building. Um, you know, would I say, are you the church? Most of you would say, yeah, yeah, I'm the church, I'm the church. Um, and when I would say, you know, are all these other churches, all these other fellowships, all these other places, are they church? And most of us would say, yeah, yeah, I'd say that. You know, if they claim his name, I'd say that they're church, right? So rather than you or I explaining it or trying to define it, what is church as in to what does it mean to do church? Let's look and see what the word has for us. Turn to Acts chapter 2. Verse 36, <clears throat> and I know that, you know, um, we actually covered um, 36 through 39 last time, but I, I wanted to look at it again because it's such a beautiful section of Scripture, um, and, and the title of today's message is just church. Um, I'm determined, you know, I, I've told you before, I really stink at doing titles and coming up with you know, points and stuff like that. So um, I'm determined to, though, for the book of Acts, to simply do um, one-word titles for every message. So this one's church. Um, <clears throat> let's look at verse 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. And, you know, we talked about this, and it's something that we've discussed is, you know, they had come through, Peter had just given this awesome uh, uh, message, you know, and called everybody and, and told them that God loves them. And, and look what you did, he says. Uh, he ends not with a, you know, everything's hunky-dory and everybody can come in and do this. He says, let all the house of Israel know. I want each and every one of you to know that you crucified Jesus. And he's not... He's Lord and Messiah. He came for you and you killed him. 
And that's the same guilt, you know, that we had talked about that you and I share in that too because it was our sins that brought him to that cross. It was my sin. It was your sin. You know, we share in this as well in the same message that Peter delivers to them is that same message. You know, and again, we had talked about this too, that even though earlier it mentions that this was all a part of God's plan, it says, you know, hey, this was God's plan. You know, it was going to happen. But it doesn't relieve us of our part in it. We are still a part of it. You and I, in our sin, are guilty before God. So, you know, what is their reaction when they hear this? Some of us, when, when we heard that, you know, do you remember when you first heard the word of Christ, when somebody shared the gospel with you? You know, before your heart was soft and you were just like, whatever, I don't need that. I don't need to be forgiven. Sounds like a certain presidential candidate says he doesn't need to be forgiven of his sins. I'm not going to say who. But most of us, when we came to a realization that God is real and that what Jesus did on the cross were true, it meant that every everything I needed to be found innocent of because I was guilty before God. So their reaction when they hear this is, verse 37, now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? And that's the thing, man, when you come to a, to a place where you realize that you really have, you really need him. You, you need him so badly the truth of the sacrifice of what he has done again it's not about you feeling guilty it's about you understanding the truth of what he has done the truth of the sacrifice of christ the truth of his word and that, you know and we talked about how hebrews four eleven, you know it, it talks about the word being alive powerful it's sharper than a two-edged sword it says and can pierce even to your soul and spirit, to the joints and marrow. And it says it is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of your heart. The word looks right into your heart. This word that he speaks to them, man, it cuts them to their heart. And they react. And that's one of the things. Understand again, when they, when they say, what do we do? They believe. That's something that you and I do too. When you believed in Jesus Christ, when you believed in what he could do for you, man, it wasn't just a, you know, oh, I believe that's great. It's, you know, time to go and, and have fun now. It was a, I believe, what do I do? Truth requires action in us. Belief requires us to take action. You know, when the reality of the fact that God came in the flesh got up on a cross and died for my sins. And he says, if you would believe in me, you would never perish. That requires something of me. It's not a work that I do. He does all the work. I just believe. But it requires something. It demands an acceptance or denial of that. How does Peter respond to them? Does he say, well, you don't really have a choice. If God's going to save you, he'll save you. Just kick back and relax. You know, or does he say, well, you know, God's going to force you to do this. He doesn't say that. He says, listen, you guys. Peter says to them, because they're believing. They're coming to him with this belief, with this understanding that they, they need salvation. And Peter says, repent, verse 38. <clears throat> and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Notice he doesn't say that you can save yourself. He doesn't say, hey, you guys, you can save yourself. He doesn't say that. They have believed. You've believed. And he says, now repent. Turn from your sins. Turn from them. Repent. And we, you know, repent, it means to agree with God on what is right or wrong in your life. And then he says, be baptized. Be baptized because you are, and remember for them, it was a huge deal for them to be baptized in the name of Jesus because that was almost like them saying, you know, not really, but it's almost as, as bad to some people as them saying, I'm no longer a Jew. For them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ could mean alienation, getting kicked out of the synagogue, and, and often did. And as we're going to see as we go through the book of Acts, for some of them it would mean death. It was a huge deal for them to be baptized. For us, it's almost a celebration. But there's going to come a time 
where it's going to be harsh and it's going to be scary. You know? And, but one of the things that he mentions, he says here, and this is one of the things that he says, is if you do, the, if you do this, if this, if this is true in your life, you will be baptized. You will, be, you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Not that you're going to get it. Not that someone's going to teach you how to do it, you know. But you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This is something that God is going to gift to you. And that's one of the things, man. For some of us, <clears throat> again, I, and I understand some people want a gift of the Holy Spirit that's going to let them speak in tongues and prophecy and foresee the future and lay hands on people and see them be healed. You know, I've seen some crazy things in my own life. I don't think that God has given me the gift of healing, but I can remember a time um, where we were living, you know, it was when we first got saved, man, and it was like it didn't matter, and we were actually living in the back of a junkie, I mean, it was, uh, was what? It was uh, me, Liz, and Carl, Alex, Casey, where she was living in the back of the TV, TV repair shop, too. Junkie TV repair shop in Baycliff. Um, and we had been saved for just a few months um, and basically had left everything, what little we did have, because I was, you know, punk, you know, working, you know, lazy idiot. Um, not a lot has changed, but some. Um, but, <laughs> you know, uh, and, and we lived in a place, there was no uh, ceiling. It was basically just the rafters because it had all fallen down at one point. Junky televisions all over the place. We all lived in one room, and we had, like, two beds. Um, and, and we had a big old claw. It was a really cool bathtub. I would love to have that bathtub still. It was one of those clawfoot lead bathtubs, you know. It was just, um, but, man, we were the happiest that we'd ever been. Not because, you know, we were, you know, it wasn't because of our circumstances or our situation. It was because we knew the Lord Jesus Christ, and we were filled with him. Um, and I can remember um, when it would get hot especially because there was just a little window unit in there and there were so many bugs because there was no sheetrock or anything on the walls. Um, so we would all get bit a lot by mosquitoes and other bugs, uh, fleas probably from the rats and stuff because we would literally watch rats catch water bugs up on the rafters. Um, and, yeah, we lived in that. And, um, and we rejoiced in everything we had. And uh, one time we were really worried about one of the kids, I think it was Casey, because uh, she was just covered with bug bites. And I was like, okay, this is bad. We've, this situation has to change. And, um, and, it, and it did change very soon after that. But I remember praying for her and, and literally watching the welts disappear from her body. And I truly believe God healed her at that moment. Uh, I was really scared for her. Um, there were also times where I've seen people truly healed. But the biggest thing and the thing that I love to see the most is when I see people healed in their spirits of hurt, of pain. When you come to a realization that God has forgiven you and you can turn away from your sins, that is the most beautiful thing that I've ever seen. And I really believe when people walk in that, even if they don't realize it sometimes, they are truly receiving that gift of the Holy Spirit because God's life has come to live in them and they change. To me, it isn't that you speak in tongues or, you know, or that you, you separate the waters over in Lake Nasworthy. It's that you change. So have you repented? Have you trusted in him? Do you believe in him? Lean on him. Rely on him. That's what matters, man. Verse 39, he says, For the promises to you and your children, all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. He's like, man, God's calling you. God called you and I even here and now, and he calls us even now when we walk away from him, when we stubbornly refuse to submit to what he has for us. He still calls us. He fulfilled his promise to the Jews at this very moment in what Peter is saying to them. He's like, prophecy is alive in front of you. And as we had talked about, the fact that God is fulfilling his promise to the Jews in this, it means to you and I that an end is coming as well. This is not all there is. And the thing is, is you and I have to make that choice too. In the same set of verses, we see where it says, He calls, He appoints, He does it. But then He also says, You choose. Do you want it? Repent, be baptized. 
Do you, do you want it? Repent. Now we come to the part where he begins to show us the church in verse 40. Let's read 40 and 41. <clears throat> and with many other words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and about that day, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. Okay, so stop there for a minute. You know, he noticed that he preaches all day long. You know, and when, they, when it first started out, as we saw earlier in this chapter, when it first started out, it was 9 in the morning. Because everybody's like, ah, you are wasted. And he was like, it ain't even 9 yet. We ain't drunk. Right? So he started at 9 o'clock. And, and throughout this day, you know, this isn't just, you know, a lot of people say, hey, it was a 3,000-person altar call. That's not what it is. Throughout the day, 3,000 people come forward to accept Christ. Now, not everyone, I, and I truly believe not everyone that heard this message that day was saved. Most of us would think, well, if Peter were just here, man, the United States would be a different place, right? No. Think about it. 3,000 souls. Um, over a million, over a million people would be coming through the temple area at this time. Upwards of a million. It could have been, you know, just, you know, e even if it were 300,000, you know, uh, the but if a million came through, what's 10% of a million? 100,000, right? So say if it was half of that, that would be 500,000. So here, you know, or uh, 50,000, but not even 50,000 people came. You know, it was 3,000 people. So, you know, if you wanted to do percentages and you want to start crunching numbers so you would see what program you wanted to spend on in the Jerusalem outreach next year, you know, you probably wouldn't hire Peter. But see, the thing is, it's not Peter saving people here. It's not Peter's preaching that's saving them. It's God. It says all Peter does is testified. It says that he testified. What that word means is he witnessed earnestly. He basically told God is real. God is real. Exhort, he says. It says he exhorted them. What does that mean? It means earnestly called to make a decision. He would say, Jesus is real. You need to choose him right now. That's all he would do. And it says he did that in many different ways. Many other words he testified. You know, he didn't just, you know, shoot off some really cool pithy saying and everybody said, hey, I think I want to get saved. It took some convincing. It took some cajoling, as it were. You know, he was going into it with these people. But again... They're not, you know, and it says, be saved. He says, be saved from this perverse generation. He doesn't say, save yourselves. He says, be saved. To be saved is to, to recognize and trust the work that Jesus did. Because if I tell you, you know, save yourselves, then you're going to think that you have to work, that you have to be righteous, that you have to be right. That's not what he says here. He says, you be saved, past tense, God saves you when you receive him. And it's not in my strength or in my choice. It's he saved me. And what does he save you from? The thing he mentions here is a perverse generation, man. They were in the midst of this place. They're in this place this, you know, where they're ruled by foreign invaders. And if you've ever read anything about Rome, they are an incredibly immoral society. Though... In their minds, they were the most elevated, you know, and, and, and the most advanced of societies of their time. They even had laws at one point in time about marriage, about, you know, if for, a lot, for the, it was crazy because though it was against the law to practice homosexuality in Rome for a great period of time, it was very popular and in to have homosexual partners. You see, so although their laws and everything reflected a right thinking, their actions and behavior did not. And they were incredibly immoral, even to the point of, you know, playing games like the way they would torture slaves and things like that. Um, the rich would because they could afford to. And here and now they're in charge of us. That's pretty perverse, isn't it? But even worse than that was their religious leaders 
the people that were supposed to be taking them to God and saying, here's God. Their religious leaders were so caught up in holding on to power and keeping control of the people and all these other things that instead of when they recognized, and remember Nicodemus came to Jesus in John chapter 3 and said, we know. You're, the, you're him, man. We know something's going on here. We know you're a teacher from God. And of course, Jesus did the full-on spiritual body slam at that point. Go read that. That's really cool. But the, the whole idea here is they knew. They knew something was going on with this, and yet instead of seeking out and seeking him, they instead did everything they could to prove him wrong and kill the Messiah. That's pretty perverse. Some of your translations may say crooked or unjust. And that's the thing about, you know, about crookedness, about not quite walking right with God, is it always ends up coming out. A crooked man can only walk a straight path before eventually you see him go off. And it becomes obvious to everybody that this guy really doesn't know how to walk that way. John the Baptist even said, you know, getting back into that crookedness and that straightness. Um, and you and I know Jesus never violated the law. He committed no sin. That's one of the reasons that you and I need him as a Savior, because we're going to. And in Isaiah 43, you know, John the Baptist quoting that, he said, the voice of one, he was the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. You see, to be brought into the presence of Jesus Christ, to go straight to him, you know, to, to have that straight road that leads to him. And, you know, you and I need to understand that. We need to come into the area where, you know, we don't, we don't want to be part of that. We have our own crooked and perverse generation, right? The most crooked and perverse one that I know is my own. I was a part of it. I, I you know, I, 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 I definitely helped make it as crooked and perverse as it could be. You know, there's no salvation in any generation. No matter what people think to say to you, there's no salvation in government, there's no salvation in charities, medicine, or man. As much as we would vaunt our technology and our advancement of society, you look around and still one out of one dying. Everybody is still dying. So who's going to save you? Medicine? Who's going to save you? Education? Mm -mm. There's only one name, it says in Acts 4.12. There is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Must. Not might, not maybe, but must. And then side note. This is a little side note. Um... We, we had talked about, because it's, you know, it's talking about baptism, and it's talking about, you know, these guys coming in and be baptized, and, you know, this is one of the side notes that I just put down here. Remember, we talked about them to be baptized in Jesus' name was an outward testimony um, that they sided with or identified with Christ. Um, Colossians 2.12 says, this is kind of the definition of baptism, Colossians 2.12 to be buried with him in baptism when, in which you were also raised with him through faith and the working of God who raised him from the dead. So that's why we get baptized. That's, a, that's one of the definitions in there. So, you know, and, and in that side note, because they're talking about baptizing 3,000 people, how do they baptize so many? Right? Because you know, most of us would go, man, that's, you know, even though it's 3,000 people, even if you had like a 12-hour day, you're still talking about a really long day, right? Well, the, see, the cool thing is, is there were a whole bunch of ritual baths that were located all around. You know, even the guys, how they would run into the pool when it would be disturbed. Uh, remember the lame man, uh, the, the man that Jesus healed, right? Okay, so you had those, you had those baths, you had the ritual baths. When you would come into the temple, you would basically have to walk through this water because you were supposed to, you know, it was called a mikvah in, in, in Jewish teaching. Um, and it means a gathering of water. Uh, and so you would have to walk through the water. It was supposed to cover every inch of your body. To, it didn't matter if 500 people had just walked through it. You and I would look at it and go, oh, nice, there's a film of skin on top. 
That's what we would look at, right? They would just go, as long as I walk through the water, I'm clean. It's what it means, not what it is, okay? So they weren't doing it for cleanliness. They were doing it as a ritual to wash themselves of the world before they came into the temple. So they were located all around the temple so that thousands of people could go through it once. And then you say, well, how do they do it in Jesus' name? Well, how many people were standing there with Peter? Anybody remember? Shout it out. How many people are standing there with Peter that are saved, that are believers, when he's preaching to them? How many? Wrong. 119. Peter's the... (laughs) Gotcha. Um, So, yeah. (laughs) But if you had 119... Let's say Peter keeps preaching, right? You got 119 folks that are baptizing people in the name of Jesus. That's about 25 per disciple in in a day. That's very doable, isn't it, when you begin to think of it like that? You know, and in many of these places, like the Solomon's Porch and all that, you could literally probably baptize 25 people at a time because some of them were huge pools, you know, like Olympic-sized pools. Some of them were just, if you were to go outside the temple, the ritual baths were just steps going down. There was flowing water, and you would walk through it and then up the other side and then into the temple, okay? So... You know, there was all kinds of stuff. I mean, if you had a guy up there going, Jesus' name, next, Jesus' name, next, you know, right? So I don't know if that's how they did it, but I'm sure it was much cooler and much more solemn occasion than that. But <clears throat> but how, the hows, the whys, the whats, what do we see as a result of this is a changed life. Is your life really different because of Christ being in your life? Look at verse 42. They continued. What did they do when this happened? They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Wow. That's kind of, you know, we, we read that and we go, well, is that how everything is supposed to be now? Well, let's kind of examine it and take a look at it. Number one, that doctrine is teaching. That's all it is, is teaching. It's Didache in the Greek. And the first thing to knowing Jesus is to know about him or know of him. How did they do it? They had the Old Testament, what we call the Old Testament, what they call the Tanakh or their scriptures. And then they had the teaching of the apostles. So their gospels were the apostles. They would literally, wouldn't that be so cool? I mean, to hear, to, for them, they knew Jesus was real. You know, he was in the news. It was like, you know, he was, you know, they, they turn on, you know, JNN and, you know, the Jerusalem News Network there in the, in the first century, which was usually some dude standing on a street corner, right? And he'd say, yeah, Jesus did this and this in the temple, and everybody tried to kick him out and all this stuff, you know, and, and, and it would all go around. So they knew that Jesus was real, but could you imagine being able to talk to Peter or somebody like that and go, what was his favorite food, right? If you had that kind of communion with him where you knew, you know, he was really gassy, right? That kind of thing. It's a personal thing. I'm not trying to be crude or anything like that. It's that where you have a friend and you know, man, he really loves this kind of joke or that kind of joke or you know, they knew him so intimately, and then you were talking to somebody that knew him that intimately. And then Jesus says, he wants to be intimate with you. How do you do that? You do that through the word of God, through that doctrine, through that teaching. You know, uh, the scriptures, it says in Second Timothy 3.16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction and righteousness. You see, the thing is, is it doesn't do you any good if you hear it and don't apply it and do it. You know, these guys hear the word and immediately obey. They immediately give themselves. They devote it. That word continued steadfastly. It means they were devoted to it. And this is one of the things that we get into now as we get into... Um, What's going on? You know, what's going on in our society? What's going on with the church today? Is there anything that we can point out that's wrong with the church that's going on with it? 
Because the teaching of the entire Word of God has waned since the inception of the church. God is always has, has his remnant. God always has people set aside. But you have today churches that, that feature thousands and thousands of people where the Word becomes a, a method or mode of entertainment where we're not really getting together and we're looking at the word as a whole and going through it. But we're, you know, I mean, we have denominations after denominations after denominations, and there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. Because some people, they want to wear suits and ties, and if you don't wear suits and ties, you might feel awkward there. There's some people where everybody wants to wear flip-flops and do their own thing, and that's cool, man. But when you begin to say that not to not belong to ours is you may not be saved is where we can kind of get into some issues and things. You know, we have cults like the Jehovah's Witness or, you know, and and then the Mormons, which is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And and they misuse the word and get away from it. And when we get away from the plain meaning of the text and everything is taken out of context, we can go to strange places indeed. As a matter of fact, 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 2 says, that is the sign of apostasy. That is a sign of the falling away, not of the world, but of the church. You see, when the church, and remember, the church isn't just the pastor. Who's the church? You're the church. And when the church as a whole begins to wander away from the word of God and begin to think, well, I'm going to relate to Jesus my own way. That doesn't sound like devotion to the word of God, does it? This was a characteristic that we see here of the early church, you know, that you and I need to remember as we do this. It was incredibly important to them. It is the first thing mentioned in the characteristics of these people being filled with the Holy Spirit and coming to believe in Jesus Christ. Now, this teaching of doctrine this is one of the things we know that god has gifted some people to do um god allows some people to do and god brings some people to do but this doesn't mean all of us should be or have that or claim that gift of teacher okay um james 3 1 says my brethren let not many of you become teachers knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment everyone wants to be a teacher but not everyone is Everyone should get to a point where they have a degree of understanding to be able to teach the Word of God. But it's one of the reasons that you and I need to be a part of a fellowship, a part of a whole, number one, because we are the body of Christ, number two, because we need somebody that's not going to give us the Scripture and say it's okay, but it's going to give us the Scripture and say you need to do this. You need to, you know, you, sometimes that, as we saw earlier, <clears throat> all Scripture is given by inspiration of God in 2 Timothy 3.16 is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And if somebody gives you the Scripture and says, brother, you need to stop doing this or that, and you say, well, whatevs, you know, you've kind of broken away from that. You're not devoted to the Word as it is. You know, but some people would think all they need to do is Bible study. You got some people that spend their entire life studying the scripture, you know, and, 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 and it's a good thing. And I, and I love the fact that we have some scholars that are truly devoted to studying the word of God. But I believe that anybody that truly studies the word will find these other three things that, that Peter mentions here or that the, the word mentions here, Luke tells us will be naturally occurring in those that really study the word. You know, it's, I don't know, for lack of a better term, it's that Christian holistic, right? It's that whole being of being Christ-like is the word, fellowship, communion, prayer. It's part of a whole. Because you can study all day long. You can know the Bible inside and out, man. I have met... I met this prisoner once at, at a prison fellowship. And that dude, man, he could, he could quote whole sections of the Bible in Greek. This guy knew the Bible back and forth. But you'd ask him, and he'd say, oh, no, I don't, I don't even believe in God. No. But I love studying that. He had no spirit, no reality of what it 
is to be a believer. You know, so some people would say, well, look at his Bible studies. Look at how much he studies the Bibles, how much he does this, all this stuff. And, you know, and, and you might even say, man, I study the Bible and I understand it better than most pastors. But if you don't have love, you have nothing. Because it goes from the study of the Word of God into fellowship. That second part, you know, it was doctrine, right? And then fellowship. That word in the Greek is koinonia. It means to converse deeply with others, to relate deeply or to have a common interest. And it's not just a common interest, but it's an active participation. You know, how many people here are like really real sports fans, like super fans? Okay, NASCAR weirdo. What about you? What's yours? Football. Anybody else a fan of football? Even if you like going to a football game or whatever your favorite sport is, whatever your favorite activity, for some of you, maybe going to choirs, I don't know. But when you go and you are in the crowd and you're taking part and you are hearing what's going on, you are actively participating. You know what I'm saying? You're having koinonia with all the people around you because it's our team. Yay, our team. Everybody paint their faces, right? And we're going to do this. And we're going to stand up and scream at the same time. And they have a common interest, and they actively participate together. That's koinonia. That's fellowship. And when you and I come here, man, it's supposed to be one of those things where when you come in, you and I know, you know what? We've been getting beat up by the world all week. I'm glad you're here. Welcome. We actively participate and say, man, I know it. I know it stinks. I know it hurts. I'm glad you're here. Come in and relate deeply. Don't, don't put on a face. Don't put on an act like everything's okay in our lives. Jesus is our communion. He's our worship. He's our love. And we're supposed to actively participate in him. And I can't do that by myself. I simply cannot. Many people think that they don't need fellowship or church as we call it nowadays, right? But how can you be obedient to the word of God? How can you emulate the early church and other commands of Christ in the scriptures without being part of a fellowship. You can't. Where are you learning to submit to others if all you do is stay alone by yourself and, and, and just try to, you know, I'm, I'm relating to Jesus my own way. There's a, there's a part in time where, yeah, there needs to be some of that, but there also is a part in time where you need to be part of a body because he calls you his body. You know, and I know, and, and again, don't get me wrong in this, because I know some people that say they teach their family and have beautiful fellowship together, and that is great. You should. You absolutely should. It is a good and beautiful thing. But they do that at the expense of going and being a part of a body somewhere and submitting in the fellowship. And what if you don't have the gift of teaching, but yet you're sitting at home and you're teaching your family, and you don't have that gift? What if you're doing more harm than good? I don't know. This is one of the things, man. Fellowship is the love of God and God's people. Not because I think you're great or I think you're an awesome dude, you know, but because he saved you just like he saved me. That gives us a commonality, a place that we can have fellowship at together. And it is a crucial characteristic in the early church and should be crucial to us because both you and I are under his blood. We're covered by his blood. Forgiven. Breaking of bread, it says, common term for the Lord's Supper, often with the early church. It was commonly practiced at every meal. Every meal. Especially when they would come together as a whole. And what a blessing it would be if we did this often with our own families. Wouldn't it be cool if once a week, even once a week, when you're just having, you know, say, hey, we have a sit-down dinner with the family once a week. We tried to do that every now and then, though we didn't practice communion during it. But oftentimes when you begin to read about the early church, you begin to see that many families did communion at their homes together. You know, you don't need to get grape juice and little bitty cups at your house or nothing like that. They didn't have those. You know they didn't have the cool trays and all that when, when Jesus and his disciples had it, right? They basically drank what was on the table and had the bread, which represented 
Christ. It represented the bread in the temple. It represented all these things. And literally, if you you know, it doesn't have to be unleavened bread. You know, you can grab a piece of wheat bread out of the pantry and, and get some water and have communion with your family. Do communion with them at a meal. You know, because you have that fellowship of the meal. Even if you're arguing with each other, end it with communion. Helps a lot of things. You know, but because 1 Corinthians 11.26 says, As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. You proclaim his death, his resurrection, and the salvation of all people. You do. You do. And then it says prayers is that fourth thing we need to pray. We have prayer every Sunday at 9 here. We regularly have prayer together. Um, at least once a month, we have our third Wednesdays where we pray together. And I was talking uh, with David the other day and saying we're, we're going to look into working something like that on a Sunday, you know, where we just meet and have fellowship and pray and, and worship and pray and just keep, and, you know, and just do that. Um, because uh, and, and we actually once a year, um, and, I don't, and we haven't done it this year, but we're going to, we'll have a schedule soon, uh, we come together, and normally we would do it, call it an evening of prayer, but I know some in our fellowship need it to happen during the day, so I'm thinking we'll have like a, a Sunday morning to afternoon, you know, four-hour session of prayer where we just come together and for uh, as long as we can go, just pray together and lift up the Lord together. Because prayer is, again, what what were the characteristics the characteristics were teaching, doctrine. They were devoted to it. Fellowship with one another. You can't say you love God and not love his people. And I'm not talking about me, okay? You guys need to love each other. You need to love people. I ain't say you got to like them. You just got to love them, okay? And then breaking of bread, that communion, being you know, willing to have that with others, to look at somebody and not go, well, or the, oh, I don't really think this person's earning the sacrifice of Christ here. It's Christ died for them. And when we have communion with each other, we're confessing that to each other. And then prayer, you know, it's, it's conversation, man. It's, the word prayer means to speak to God. It's speaking to God. I mean, you know, it, that's one of the reasons that many divorces happen in our country is because couples forget how to speak to each other. They forget how to talk to each other. That's one of the things many friendships break up is because they forget how to talk to each other. You and I, we know that that communication is an integral part of having a relationship with someone. It's not about you sending a list to God of, you know, hey, God, I need these things. It's, God, I need to talk to you. It really stinks here right now. I don't want this in my life. I don't want, you know, and you begin to talk with him and you begin to converse. Sometimes his spirit moves upon you. Sometimes you hear it in the word. Sometimes a brother or sister in Christ will come up and say, man, I just read this and it was awesome. And you'd be like, oh, oh, oh that was God. He's answering my prayer. There's so many different things, man. You know, and, and to, to not believe that communication is a part of it is like when you, how many people in here have, have had a girlfriend or a boyfriend at least once in their life, right? Right? You see, without talking, without conversing, there's no way to deepen that fellowship, that relationship that you have. We're supposed to constantly be talking to him. Man, do you, I remember, and I, and I heard somebody say this. I heard somebody talk about it. I was like, man, I used to do that too. When I first got saved, I would literally like ask God, you know, I'd be like, man, should we do this? Should we do that? God, should I go here? Should I go there? You know, every person I'd meet, God, do you want me to share the gospel with this guy? God, should I do this? God, should I do that? You know, it was like a constant, you know, like when your kid annoys you about every single thing, Right? Or when you're training somebody on how to do a job, and they're like, okay, do I push the button now? You know, I told you 15 times, push the button, dude. You know, but they constantly, act, and it's like, but we get this, I don't know, man, we get this place where we begin to think that I, I, I don't really need God as much anymore because I'm a much more mature believer, and we stop praying. Paul, who was an apostle, home dude literally could wipe a sweat with a hanky, and people would touch it and get healed. 
All right? That's pretty powerful. And he said in 1 Thessalonians 5.17, pray without ceasing. For a guy like that to say, pray without stopping, guys. If you're not praying, huh. This is a character, and dude, this is this is me. This is convicting me because man, I need to pray so much more. And what's the other characteristic? Fear. Most people today don't want to talk about fear. We shouldn't fear God. We and, and many people will dismiss this. They'll nod towards it and say, "It's really, it's really reverential awe." It's not the way it's used in Scripture. It's not used like that. It is used in Scripture. Let me ask you this. Does reverence come to mind when you hear Jesus say, this is Jesus now, and he says in Matthew 10, 28, do not fear those who kill the body but, but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Does that sound like just want you to have reverential awe? No, that, that's scary, man. That's, that's scary. And if it's not scary, then you don't believe. You know, and, and, and again, it's not reacting in fear. It's not like that. It's not like, you know, again, it's not being that kid who is at home that mom has said, wait until your father gets home, right? That's not it. It's not that kind of fear. It's he is powerful. He is God. And all the things that he said, all the things that he said are going to happen. And these people that I love are going to go to hell if I don't share with them or if they don't get saved. The reality of everything becomes, you know, most of us would fear the person that could kill us before we would fear the one who, after we die, can send us to hell. And I really believe that is because he's not real to us. If you don't have a reverential, truly awesome, crazy out fear of God, he may not be real to you. I can remember before I was saved watching TV preachers, right? You watch TV preachers, man, before I was saved, you know, I'd, I'd be drinking or something like that, watching, uh, remember the late night guys, and, and we make fun of them, and we go bleed, 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 and act like we were speaking in tongues when they were and all that good stuff. I could probably name names, and you'd know some of them. But I remember watching them, and I would actually talk to Liz and say, why would I want to worship a God whose own people don't even fear him? That's not a God to me. That's somebody you made up. They're worshiping their own version of God. It's the same thing that most of us did in our lives when we said, well, I don't believe my God would do that. You see, the moment you make a statement like that without Scripture to back it up, you're making up your own God. You're doing your own thing. They respected money more than they respected God. When God truly begins to put his hand on our lives, it's a wake-up call. Psalm 64, 9, speaking of when God begins to move on people, it says, All men shall fear and shall declare the work of God, for they shall wisely consider his doing. Because you look at it and you go, okay, this God thing is real. Jesus is real. Jesus happened. The fact that Jesus came and died on the cross for our sins means that I am a, <laughs> there's an eternal consequence to not receiving him. And what is that eternal consequence? Hell. The reality of it changes when this happens. He is real. And perhaps, you know, and I don't know, I, I don't want to presume, I don't want to assume, and, and we'll see more as we go through the scriptures is this one of the reasons, perhaps, that we don't see real signs and wonders done as much anymore? We don't see them done because there's no fear of God. There's no real devotion to the Word. There's no fellowship of people where we love each other. We're not communing together. We're not praying together. No fear. No respect. question okay all right let's burn through this I gotta get you guys out of here verse 44 now all who believe were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods divided them among all as anyone had need 
So continuing daily with one accord in the temple, breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Now, remember as you're going through this, because a lot of people look at this and say, okay, we're all supposed to sell everything, you know, get Birkenstocks and wear flowers in our hair. And why'd you look at me like that, Lisa? You think I'm talking about you? Did you? <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's not about living in a commune. That's not what's happening here. Because you have to remember that most of the people that are, that are doing this, that are hearing this message, are pilgrims, right? They, they live, and, and we talked about that when they were here. They live in Phrygia. They live in Syria. They live in, you know, in, in the Asiatic countries and stuff like that. We talked about the languages that they were, they were hearing. This is not their home. Jerusalem is not where they live. And many of them have spent every dime that they have and barely probably have enough to get home with. They've, spent, they've invested everything into coming to the temple for the feasts, being obedient to the word of God. So they have nothing. For them to stay and get all this teaching means to starve, means to live in the streets. So what happens? They have all things in common. It isn't communism. Understand, communism is what's yours is mine. That's communism. That's not right. Capitalism is what's mine is mine. That's not what they're doing here either. The practice that they're experiencing here at this moment is what's mine is his, which means it gets used to help others. These folks had no home. They were going to be missionaries. They were going to be carrying the word of God back home. They needed the teaching of Jesus Christ, and what happens? Boom, these folks need shelter. They're shown shelter. They're not freeloaders. They're training to be missionaries. Needs were met. Wherever there was space, supply, it was given to meet the need. These guys weren't living off of the church. They were the church, and the church was living together with them. So this does not mean we're supposed to do you know, to live in a commune together. But don't dismiss it too quick either. You see, because one of the reasons that they were able to accomplish and do what they did, you know, the obvious fact of it is, is because they believed in a soon and immediate return of Jesus Christ. If you knew, and, I, you know, and again, everybody does this, but, I, you know, I just want you to kind of, you know, you ponder this in your own heart, your own head. If you knew, if you knew beyond the shadow of a doubt that Jesus Christ was coming back at 7 p.m. tomorrow, I mean, you knew it. He appeared to you in a vision. He said, hey, yo, bro, I'm coming back at 7 tomorrow. Be real. Boom, he took off, right? And you'd be like, okay, Jesus is coming at 7 tomorrow. What will be important to you from that moment on? What will be important to you? Would you really care whether or not you had this if you knew that you could invest in someone? You know, if the end of the world were coming tomorrow, most of us would go absolutely crazy. But, you know, but if Jesus were coming back tomorrow and we knew it beyond the shadow of a doubt, and the thing is, man, is we don't know how long we have. You know, we could die at any moment. You and I don't have the day guaranteed to us. I might be looking, you, you know, you might be looking at his face by the end of the day. And what do they do? Do they react to this, this fear, this awe, this everything that's going on? How do they react to it? With gladness and simplicity of heart. You and I make things, we tend to make things so complicated. We, you know, we begin to say how people need to behave, react. But these guys, everything's just simple, man. It's not really super complicated. No qualifiers, no anything. You know, we just sang earlier, there is no one else for me, none but Jesus. Did, did I sing it or did I mean it? Do I look to someone else to fulfill all the things that I have in my life or do I look to him? Because that's the simplicity of That's the simplicity of heart. When I can just get everything I need from him. <laughs> then it becomes a lot easier to have a relationship with my husband or wife. Not my husband, but you know. A relationship with others becomes much simpler and easier when your fulfillment and everything you get in a relationship comes from Him. 
the gladness and simplicity of heart. They praised God, it says. They had favor with people at that moment. That will end, and we're going to see that. And notice, they're still Jews. They're still coming to the same place that Jesus taught every time he was in Jerusalem. He was at the temple daily. And they do the same thing. They are emulating their Lord. Do we do that? Do I emulate him in the way that I live my life and the things that I do? Again, even when they're teaching, even when they're sharing about him, and this is a thing that the religious leaders know because the implications of what Christ has done changes everything. It changes the sacrificial system. It changes the Jewish religious system as a whole because it no longer becomes about people having to come to the priest to interact with God and to make sacrifices. It is there is one sacrifice, one intermediary between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, and now I can come directly boldly approach the throne of grace. And this is something that you have as well. It says, the Lord added to the church daily those that were being saved. Again, the Lord added. Not an evangelistic program, not a method. Not even, it doesn't say Peter added. It says the Lord added. And this is a thing that you and I need to understand. We just need to be real. I'm not saying we can't use methods. You want to use the Romans road to share the gospel with people? That's great. Do it. Um, uh, you know, but Harvest America is not going to save people. The Lord will save them. Harvest America is just a vehicle that it can be used by God to share the gospel with people. You know, and that's the thing you and I have to get into, that it's, it's, it's about Jesus. It's not about the preacher, the method, the church, you know, the charity, whatever it was that brought him there. We get focused on the vehicle rather than the giver of all good things. They're just being saved, man. They're, they're not saving themselves, but believing in a Lord that could save them. So in closing, all right, short closing, I promise. Well, I'm not going to promise, but. What do we see in these verses that we've looked at together? We see a reality of change, a sweeping disregard for personal desires and wants, a literal fear of God because he's more real to them than he ever has been. He's no longer a column of smoke or a column of fire following them around the desert. He's now dwelling inside of them. He, is, is he dwelling in you? You know, we, we, we sing the song, you know, light a fire in me, right? But has he lit a fire in you? Is that... You know, do you have, do you long for, are you devoted to the teaching of his word? Do you long to be with his people? Despite our differences and, you know, despite all those things, do we have a common fellowship with others that call on his name? Do I share and remember the cross as often as I can, that resurrection, that breaking of bread? Do I pray? Do I pray on my own and with others? It's... You know, and again, you've got to get it into your heart that it's not, you know, can I be saved or will I be saved? But you have to understand you are saved. If you've believed in him, if you trust in him, rely on him, you're saved because he finished the work. You're not earning your way into heaven. You can't. He did that for you. Jesus alone is our salvation. Jesus alone is is our salvation. And repentance comes easy once you begin to trust Him and believe in that. Obedience doesn't become a struggle, but a desire. Can we slip, be carnal? Sure. Yeah, we can do that. But it's something we're supposed to avoid, not be okay with. So catch that fire, guys. Catch that. What is the church? You are. I am. Yeah, we're the church. So let's pray that he'll be the church. Let's, let's stand and pray together if you would. <clears throat> Father, as we come together, Lord, I just thank you so much that as we submit ourselves to you, oh, Father, as we give ourselves to uh, the teaching of your word, as Lord, we are devoted to it, Father, because it is there that we meet our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. 
And Father, as much as your Spirit communicates with us and, and reminds us that we are yours, Lord, it also testifies of Jesus Christ and brings us back to him every time. So Lord, I just pray if there's any here, if there's anyone here, Lord, who, who Father, needs to repent to you, come to you, not to me, not to anybody else, but to you. I pray that you would give them that heart today. That they would repent, Lord, and turn away from the things that have been dragging them down. Father, for myself, Lord, for each and every one of us, I pray that you make us more and more to look like your son, Jesus. The one that died for us. The one that rose again from the dead. The one that has saved us. Lord, I bless everyone here. And Father, may they be filled with your spirit and walk in your grace. And know beyond the shadow of a doubt that they are saved. If there's anyone here, Lord, who is unsure, then I pray that you would give them the reality of that salvation. That fear, Lord, of a reality of God in their lives. That humbling thing that reminds us of who you are. I lift everyone here up to you in Jesus.